Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of this conference. Uh, my name is Marcel Torres. I'm in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm going to talk about using machine learning for parameter estimation and sensitivity analysis. So right up front, I want to point out that the models I'm going to be talking about, just to be, to be able to fit them in the time that we have, um, are going to be simple deterministic ODE models, but these methods can be applied to agent-based models as well, and that is really the goal here, is to apply these methods to more complex models that would be difficult to do, um, that would be difficult to analyze in traditional ways. Um, so, for example, if we have a system of differential equations with n state variables and m parameters theta, and we have model output that, of course, depends on the model parameters and the state variables, then what we can do, um, what we want to do, is we want to be able to identify the parameters that capture the expected behavior. That's basically the purpose of modeling. Right? And this can be with data or without data. Um, often early in the model development process, we have little to no data. So often what we want to do is figure out what sort of behavior the model is capable of producing to you know, determine if it's a good model or any refinements that need to be made and just to understand the model better. Um, so in this case, we know the structure of the model. It's not a case where we're trying to identify the model. We know what the structure is. We want to learn more about the parameters and how they influence model behavior, or we want to find bounds on parameter space for when we actually have data so that we can estimate the parameters. And just to give it a little bit more concreteness, um, for example, this model could be as simple as a deterministic SIR model, where you have um, that model is spread of infectious disease, where you have S representing the susceptible population, I the infected population, R the removed population. And the only parameters in the model, there's just three of them, mu, beta, and gamma. And then in this example, uh, the model output of interest could be the infected population at any given time t. And I chose this as the model output because this state variable we would expect to differ at sufficiently large t between a disease-free state and an endemic state. So often in biological modeling, really in any kind of modeling, we want to classify outcomes. Um, in biological modeling it might be disease-free versus endemic, or it might be septic shock versus recovery, chronic inflammation versus resolution. Usually we tend to think of things in terms of classification and that makes it well suited for machine learning. So in a deterministic model like the SIR example I just showed, the only inputs to the model are the initial conditions and the model parameters theta. So those inputs completely determine the model output and it becomes very important to um, understand how the parameters influence that model output. And during the model building and validation process, um, one of the things that we do, or we should do anyway, is sensitivity analysis to identify sources of uncertainty, um, whether that's uncertainty that's inherent in the model, whether um, something that we need to quantify for later data so that we can identify uncertainty in the form that comes from data collection when we actually estimate the parameters. Um, often we want to understand how parameters um, interact with each other, how we can vary parameters to get different behavior from the model. Um, so often what we'll do instead of choosing parameters and saying these are the correct parameters for the model, we will identify confidence or prediction intervals around them. We will explore what happens if we vary them in concert or individually or pairwise. There's a lot of exploration that should go on in this process um, in order to be able to have any confidence whatsoever in the predictions from the model. So some things that are often done are um, identifying some kind of metric for sensitivity for the parameters, how they influence model output. Um, what I have pictured there, for example, is a root mean square sensitivity measure. We could check and see how varying parameters one at a time, local sensitivity analysis, 
um, influences model output, set a threshold and cut off and fix any parameters that don't have a direct impact on model output. Um, we might examine pairwise interactions between parameters with plots. There's a lot of things that are done to understand how parameters interact with each other and how they influence model output. But a lot of those methods are difficult to communicate to people outside of mathematics and kind of difficult to interpret, which is part of the motivation that I will talk about in some of the following slides for using decision trees because they're so nice and visual and you can look at combinations of parameters versus individual or pairwise. Another uh, part of the model development process is estimating parameters. So in this case, we want to select parameter values that match experimental data as closely as possible in the presence of experimental data. And fitting parameters in itself is a computationally intensive, lengthy, involved process um, trying to identify where to start searching for possible values for the parameters can be difficult, which is another um, benefit of using of doing some parameter exploration early in the model development process, because that can narrow bounds for searching that you do in order to fit experimental data. And that is actually part of the motivation that I'll discuss on the next slide. So I mentioned one of the benefits to using the tree format is that you can really appreciate interactions between multiple parameters and how the associated output uh, relates to those combinations of parameters. Um, I can't stress that enough that it's very difficult sometimes to communicate to collaborators that you can't really, ex that there are interactions between parameters, the one may compensate for another and you can't really just change one in the model and have things come out the way you expect. So this is a really nice visual way of showing that the same behavior can result from different combinations of parameters. Um, a lot of other statistical and learning based methods of parameter exploration are not as easily visualized. Uh, another benefit is um, identifying sensitive parameters that drive model behavior. Um, and a limitation, I mean, you could view this as a limitation or a benefit. We can tie this directly to whatever the um, outcome of interest is in the model. So I mentioned endemically infected versus uninfected could be one or epidemic versus disease free. Um, if we're interested in how parameters lead to outcomes, then this is a good way of identifying which parameters drive those outcomes. And we can change those class definitions dependent on whatever the behavior is that we're interested in. So we can uh, explore multiple things like stable versus unstable or endemic versus epidemic for the same model. And it's easily done with this method. Uh, another benefit that you don't get from some other learning based methods is the ability to identify representative sets. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, so what we can get from these trees is not just feature importance or parameter importance. We can also find collections of parameters that um, differ fundamentally but lead to the same outcome. And that's something I will show visually later that'll make a little bit more sense. But finding representative sets that might illustrate different subpopulations or allow us to figure out what parameters to lump for model production and other things is very useful. And then finally, I had mentioned setting bounds on parameter space for fitting or reasonableness. So we can look at biologically reasonable versus unreasonable and identify whatever the parameter ranges are for that. It's something that can come in handy early on in the process um, before data is even available. So I'll quickly go over the methods here of how we would combine random sampling to produce a data set with um, random forest algorithm to be able to explore parameters. Um, we are starting with this same simple mathematical model and output idea. 
Latin hypercube sampling, at least that's the method I use, is performed over all parameters that aren't fixed um, by randomly sampling without replacement from a probability density function. So it's pictured here as a uniform distribution, but you could use any distribution. A normal distribution is common also. Um, and this would be done over n equally sized bins. So you decide how many parameter sets you want to create because that's what comes out is a data matrix containing n parameter sets that each have all of the non-fixed model parameters, in this case, m of them. And that forms um, what I'll refer to as the Latin hypercube sampling matrix, the LHS matrix. So the next step, once you have that matrix, once you have all those um, parameter sets, is to generate n sets of time series data, and then a vector of model output sampled at a chosen time is selected as the response variable. So of course you're not limited to picking just one time, you can look at multiple times. Um, it might be that you're interested in when something peaks versus two different classes of behavior or um, the long-term behavior or anything else. You just choose whatever it is you want to sample from that time series data as your output. And then you assign, you classify that data. Um, and I'll go over an example later. So you assign a class label and then you create a data set that concatenates the parameter sets and the class label on the model output that's associated with each parameter set. And once we have that data matrix, we train a random forest classifier with bootstrapping. And then um, we look at different results depending on what information we wanna get from that uh, random forest classifier, we would obtain feature permutation importance from the average results, and we could use that as a parameter sensitivity measure. And then we could look at uh, individual decision trees to obtain parameter subsets for parameter space exploration. So just very briefly, because of time limitations, um, I do have a reference at the end from Riemann et, et al, but very briefly, for each decision tree in the forest, uh, binary tree classifiers repeatedly split the subsets of the measurement space, which in this case is, are the parameter sets, into two descendant subsets at each node, each node T, um, and subsets that aren't split are terminal nodes. So for example, in that upper right picture, if we have two measurements, x sub one and x sub two, and two classes, then that simple example tree shows how splits can occur on either measurement variable, which in this case are parameters. And then the partition of the learning set corresponding to each classifier, which would be the model output, is found by combining all the terminal nodes with the same class. And then how we determine where to split um, requires that we define an impurity measure and there are a lot of different ones that could be used. We use the Gini impurity index here, and impurity is just the number of different classes in each subset. And of course, there are three parts to constructing a tree. There's find, uh, selecting the splits, the decision to terminate or keep splitting, and the assignment of each terminal node to a class. And um, determining when to stop, basically we declare a node to be terminal if all observations are from one class or if a predefined criterion is met. So the criterion I use here is just the maximum depth of the tree, but there's other criteria that could be used as well. And finally, I just wanna go through a very small, simple example of how we would do this in practice. So in this example, um, we're using a model of HIV interaction with T cells developed by Perelson et al that has four state variables, um, uninfected, latently infected, and actively infected T cells, and then free infectious virus particles. And this is a deterministic OD model that has the four listed state variables, it has nine parameters, and then one output of interest that we're gonna look at here that is the free virus particles. And in this model, there are two steady states possible, either the uninfected, state with essentially no free virus. Of course, it's not gonna be zero, but it'll be near zero. And then the endemically infected state, 
with a constant level of free virus. And what I've chosen here um, is the free infectious virus particles at day 4,000, and that will be the classifier. So that will sort between the two possible outcomes, either uninfected at that time or endemically infected at that time. So in this case, um, the parameter for the maximum T cell population Tmax was fixed and all the other parameters were sampled from a uniform distribution to create the data matrix. So each row of that matrix has a parameter set that consists of the remaining parameters. And the table there shows the default parameters that were used for analysis um, in Perelson et al. and the parameter ranges that were used for light and Latin hypercube sampling um, and calculation of partial rank correlation coefficient in Merino et al. And I have the references at the end. So I chose this benchmark example to compare to analytic methods and then statistical methods that have been used previously on this model. So I use the same Latin hypercube sampling ranges for that reason. So once we have the data set, the next step is to implement random forest algorithm and there's lots of implementations out there. I happen to use the random forest classifier <clears throat> from the Python scikit-learn machine learning package. Um, so this process involves computing n number of trees, um, bootstrapping, selecting various arguments in the model that I'm going to compare results for on the next slide. Um, I mentioned choosing a cri criterion. Um, here I chose the Gini um, impurity index, but one thing I'll note is that permutation index might be preferred in the case of many correlated parameters, um, and that's discussed in one of the references I have at the end. So we choose the number of trees that we want in the forest, we aggregate the predictions, we use the out-of-bag score, um, that gives us a sense of how correct the predictions are. And then we would compute feature importance based on the averaging from all of the trees. And very briefly, tuning the arguments in the random forest is gonna impact results. And I show here what the impact is of varying things like number of trees in the forest, maximum number of features, um, in this case, parameters to split on, the maximum tree depth, there's considerations like you don't want to have too large of a decision tree because that's going to reduce the whole purpose of doing this, which is really interpretability of interactions between parameters and parameter sets. So those are all things that need to be um, considered when using this method. Results wise, the random forest feature importance in this case selects the same sensitive parameters as traditional local sensitivity analysis done using a system of partial differential equations, and the global method that also computes partial rank correlation coefficient. And these sensitive parameters are also the bifurcation parameters that were discovered originally analytically for this simple model. So this just shows a comparison of how the same parameters are chosen as sensitive across a variety of methods. So it's just sort of a verification step. important to point out that um, interactions between parameters don't impact the prediction accuracy, but it's something we have to think about in terms of sensitivities and feature importance. And um, what could be considered a benefit of random forest is that multiple parameters that interact that also impact model output will still be selected as being important. Um, that may or may not be an issue. So often in, dyna in a dynamical model versus a statistical model, we don't want to necessarily exclude correlated parameters and only focus on parameters with main effects. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing that involvement in interactions can actually boost a parameter's importance um, or sensitivity, but they should always be investigated. And one simple way of accounting for that is to scale the feature importances by the number of times a particular feature appears in trees in the forest. And then, you know, there's always, there's always gonna be multiple approaches to exploring parameters rather than just one. So you could also cluster parameters, look at how um, correlated parameters group, and then select one in that group to be used for splitting in the random forest. You can look at pairwise interactions. There's lots of other things that could be done to further investigate that. And then finally, the decision rules that come from the trees can be used for parameter sampling ranges to identify parameter subsets. 
Um, we can drill down further, for example, on the endemically infected outcomes and find parameter combinations that lead to an overall class of endemically infected, but with fundamentally different behaviors as is shown here. So this is interesting for everything from um, determining what's physiologically reasonable to identifying subpopulations with different characteristics or for model reduction by lumping parameters. It's just one of the nice benefits for this very simple method of exploring parameter space. And then finally at the end, I have some references that I um, cited during the course of the presentation and that are worth looking into for this method. Thank you very much.